Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do Friday Reads. I skipped last week because after I finished the Booktube Prize, I took a little bit of time off from reading and I had to do my monthly reading wrap-up for March anyway, so I'm back at the Friday Reads game. A couple of things I want to talk about. One thing I did not get to talk about last week since I didn't do a Friday Reads video is Beverly Cleary. She actually died the same day as Larry McMurtry, and I was able to talk about Larry McMurtry in my Friday Reads video for that week because it happened right before I recorded. The announcement about Beverly Cleary dying happened after I recorded the video, so I was unable to talk about it, and because I didn't do a Friday Reads last week, I'm talking about it now. It's really late. But I definitely wanted to mention her passing because she is an author who meant a lot to me when I was young and a reader. I talk a lot about Roald Dahl and Matilda because those are books that I really love, but I also really enjoyed Beverly Cleary's books as a kid. I read every single Ramona book. I read Henry Huggins. I read Ribsy. All of those, and they meant a great deal to me. And what's interesting is that for some reason, I remember the Roald Dahl books. They stuck in my mind. I don't remember a lot that happened in the Ramona books, but I remember loving them, and I just tore through them. I remember the sense of excitement I used to get when my mother would take me to the library and I would search for the next book in the Ramona series. And then eventually I also read Henry Huggins' Ribsy. I think The Mouse and the Motorcycle was another one. I just remember being so excited about getting to the next book of hers and it meant a lot. So I felt like I had to mention her passing and her wonderful career. I'm sure a lot of you enjoyed her books as well. Another thing I wanted to talk about is the International Booker. This is kind of old news at this point. I did not manage to get a reaction video to the long list, and I'm going to be honest with you, I have not really had a chance to dig through the books that are on the long list. I will do that at some point. I'm going to link the long list down below if you want to check it out. I may look a little more closely once we get to the short list for the International Booker, but it's just something I have not really been able to spend a whole lot of time on or with yet. But since I haven't spent a whole lot of time with it, I would love to hear recommendations. I've seen a couple of things online, but if you have recommendations based on what's on the long list, things you'd like to see on the short list, please comment down below because I would like to take a deeper look at some point and I would appreciate any help pointing me in any specific direction for what might be good, what might be something to pay attention to. In more recent news, something that's not old because I didn't do a Friday Reads video last week, it was announced just this week that Tessa Thompson is starting her own production company and one of her first projects is going to be an adaptation of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Yes, my beloved The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. And I am really excited about that. It's a really interesting idea for a series. I assume it's a series and not a TV movie. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how they do it. And I think Tessa Thompson is such an interesting choice to produce that. And I really trust that she'll do a good job. I'll link the article where they announce this down below. I'm really fascinated to see how this works. And I have a lot of high hopes for this at the Pulitzer Prizes, even though a lot of people call it an underdog. I don't expect that it will win, but I would be really happy if it did. In similar news, this also just won the Penn Faulkner Award, which has me really excited. I love seeing recognition for this book because I just love it, and I feel like it hasn't gotten as much as it probably deserves, so I just really love that. A quick note, somebody mentioned the Penn Faulkner Award on my Pulitzer Prize predictions video, which I will link down below, and I feel like it could be a mark in The Secret Lives of Church Ladies' favor, but there is not a very strong correlation between the Penn Faulkner Award and the Pulitzers at all. I did kind of look, and I think in the last 10 years, one of the books was either a fi finalist or um, won. By and large, the books that are finalists for or win the Penn Faulkner Award don't really cross into the Pulitzer Prize. But you never know, because it can be a really wild prize. So we're going to have to wait until June to find out. Now, I mentioned in the comments on that video that after I posted it, they pushed the date of the prize announcement back to June 11th, just to troll me. But that's okay, because my predictions video will still stand. <laughs> it's going to be what it's going to be. The books aren't really going to change between now and June. It is interesting, though, because I know they delayed the announcement of the Pulitzer Prize because they want to meet in person to discuss the books. And 
part of me just still wonders, like, was that really necessary? Couldn't they just talk over Zoom, have a phone call? It doesn't replace the, the in-person conversation that you can have, but I don't know, wouldn't you just revisit the idea of meeting in person next year and do the prize on time? I mean, June 11th is even later than they announced the prize last year. So who knows? I'm just being picky because I want to know what wins. That's what's really happening here. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to mention that just happened today, Brian over at Bookish did a video called Bookish After Dark. I found it really interesting and I recommend you check it out as well. I will put a link to it down below. I love the concept of Bookish After Dark. He sits in a suit next to a fireplace. It's just a really fun idea for a video. But then the content of the video itself was really interesting. He talks about Ernest Hemingway and gender fluidity and the ways in which Hemingway himself played with gender fluidity, but also a lot about Ernest Hemingway's son, Gregory, and his relationship to gender fluidity and perhaps transgender identity. And I just thought that was really interesting. I did not know anything about any of this. And there's a little bit about Hemingway's relationship with Gregory as well. I found it really fascinating and I'm gonna be looking more into it. Brian mentioned a Ken Burns documentary about Hemingway that discusses some of these things. I will be looking for that as well. And I definitely recommend checking out his video down below because I found it fascinating. And it added a lot of layers to Ernest Hemingway who already is an author who has a lot of layers. So check it out. And it's so interesting to talk about things like gender fluidity with people who lived in the past because our understanding of gender fluidity, of what it is to identify as transgender, has changed so much just in the last 10 years. It's interesting as well because it's so difficult to figure out labels and we just don't know how somebody would have identified if they had access to the labels that we have now or the definitions, however you want to phrase it. It's a really interesting concept. It's something that I find fascinating to think about. So again, I recommend checking out Brian's video as a launch pad for that. Let's move into the actual Friday Reads portion of my Friday Reads video where we catch up on what my reading life has been. I mentioned that I took a little bit of a break after I finished my reading for the BookTube Prize. I took my time in picking up another book. Because there was such a crush to get all of my reading in for the booktube prize, I definitely took some time to myself once it was all done. So I finished my reading on a Sunday and I took a couple of days and called the rest of March a wash, <laughs> figuring I wasn't gonna finish anything. I needed a little bit of time to myself and that was perfect. And I feel like I'm starting April much more refreshed than I had been when I was trying to cram a lot of stuff in. I did manage to finish one book. I picked up The Final Revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton again. I had made progress. I was a little more than halfway through, maybe like 75% of the way through, before I had put it down in order to focus on my booktube prize reading. And I really wanted to get back to it. So I had a buddy read that I was starting in April. We'll get to that one next. But I picked this up first knowing that I had just a tiny little bit left to go and I finished it. And I'm really glad I didn't let this one slip away as I had to focus on my booktube prize reading because I really enjoyed this. It's very interesting. So I've been talking about this a fair amount and I've been ta telling you about how it's an oral history. It's kind of like a behind the music style format. It talks about Opal and Nev, obviously. Opal is a black soul singer from Detroit. Nev is this pasty white British folk singer. And they form an unlikely duo because the label thinks he needs somebody to balance out his sound. And they find Opal and bring her to New York. And she becomes this big personality to balance him out. And they do an album. It doesn't really take off. But then they become almost infamous after a riot at one of their first major performances. And that riot becomes the linchpin of the book. I have also mentioned that the person who is editing this oral history has a history with that riot. Her father was a drummer for Opal and Nev who was killed in that riot. And she is doing this oral history as a way of examining his relationship with Opal and Nev. He had been having an affair with Opal until his death. And that seems like an interesting framing device. What's really interesting about this is that as the book progresses, the oral history format, the behind the music style format, sort of falls away. 
and it starts becoming more of a traditional narrative. It becomes much more about the narrator's story as she discovers things about the riot and about Opal and Nev and the choices that they had made and the paths that their careers took as a result of those choices. And it becomes this really interesting story about whose story we believe, whose story matters in the media, and who gets to tell the story, and who gets pushed to the side and treated like they are not as good. And it's so interesting. And it really grapples with the racial politics of all of those questions and the racial politics of celebrity and music and femininity and feminism in such very interesting ways. I really enjoyed this book and I would recommend it. I feel like it taught me a lot and the way in which it became something that was really unexpected in the last part really opened my eyes a lot. And I just think it seems like you know what to expect from this book because we've had an oral history about a music group that ultimately breaks up after hit producing a hit record, Daisy Jones and the Six. We've had Utopia Avenue, which is about a band that does, I think, one or two hit records and then breaks up for different reasons. But it seems like you know what the story is going to be. And Donnie Walton takes this in such an unexpected direction. And she does so much. It's a flawed book. I think some of its approaches hinge on slight contrivances and things, but it ends up being this really beautiful story. And I recommend it. I really appreciated what she does in this book, The Final Revival of Opal and Nev. I recommend it a lot. So that's what I finished. What did I start? I mentioned that in April, because of Aussie April, I am doing a buddy read of The Yield by Tara June Winch with Sean the Book Maniac. We got into the first 50 pages of it this week. And what an immersive experience the first 50 pages are, which is interesting because so much happens. There's so much that is set up in those 50 pages, and yet you just feel completely pulled in. There's a map in the beginning of the book, and if you follow along, you know I love a book with a map. But the reason I'm showing this to you is that part of what is set up in the first 50 pages is the geography of this town where it happens. And at the same time that you were getting to understand the geography of the town, you were getting to understand the characters in this family and their really complex generational history. And yet it feels so fluid. It doesn't feel like you're getting a lot of information thrown at you, and yet you understand so much. And one of the things that Tara June Winch does so successfully is you really feel like you know her characters pretty much immediately. And that is so difficult to do. So it's early times. A lot can happen as we continue to work our way through this book. But what a promising beginning. I think there's potential for this to be my favorite read of the year. The first 50 pages of The Yield definitely compete with the first 50 pages of The Prophets. It remains to be seen how the rest of The Yield will hold up to the rest of The Prophets. But I'm really glad that I'm getting around to this for Aussie April for another buddy read with Sean. And just because it's something that I've been really wanting to read for a while. And what's also interesting about this is that it really deals with the indigenous experience in Australia, but that feels extremely relevant to the indigenous experience here in the United States. And Sean was saying that it also feels extremely relevant to the indigenous experience in Canada. So even though it is extremely specific to its region, it has this universal appeal and theme. And there are lines that immediately just jumped out to me. There's, there's a character, August, who has been gone from her, her home for 10 years, and she comes back and she walks around and she opens the door. And the ways in which things are familiar and the ways in which things are changed really remind me of what it's like to go back to, say, New York, where everything is familiar and yet everything is different. And it also reminds me of a Neil Diamond song, I Am, I Said, where he talks about LA's fine, but it ain't home, New York's home, but it ain't mine no more. And that really resonates with me every time I go back to New York. And I was reminded of it as I was reading The Yield and as August goes back to her childhood home. Another thing that really struck me, and I don't want to get into it too much, is when August talks about her childhood, 
with her parents who were not really great parents. They didn't really have food. And a lot of the things that she talks about in those parts reminded me of stories that my foster son has told. And that's why I don't want to get into it because it's not my story to tell. It goes to show how, even though this book is about a very specific time, a very specific place, and very specific characters, it has all of this universal resonance. And again, it's really early. Who knows how this is going to turn out. But I'm really enjoying the yield so far. We'll see how that goes. I also started an audio this week. It's Homeland Elegies by Ayad Akhtar. And I'm really glad to be getting to this book because it is something that I think could be a potential spoiler for the Pulitzer Prize, like The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. And I'm really enjoying it so far. I'm only an hour and a half into the audiobook. But it's a really interesting story, especially because it is a very deliberate blend of fiction and nonfiction. Ayad Akhtar is a playwright who has won a Pulitzer Prize for a play that very much deals with Muslim identity and experience. And the character in Homeland Elegies is a playwright named Ayad Akhtar who won a Pulitzer Prize for a play about the Muslim experience in America. And so much of this first hour and a half of the audiobook feels personal again. It's like a very specific experience with him and his family and his father and Donald Trump. And yet it reminded me so much of conversations I had with my mother leading up to the 2016 election and after the 2016 election. So again, you have that idea of something that is very specific and yet universal and relatable. And it's really interesting and I can't wait to see where it goes. I, I think it's going to be another really good read. And Ayad Akhtar reads the audio, which is also very interesting. One thing that I find fascinating is when an audio is read by the author of the book, because they can put the emphasis where they want it to go. And that is definitely the case with Homeland Elegy. So I can't wait to get further into it. It's just been a busy week, so I haven't had a whole lot of time to listen to anything. So I'm looking forward to getting further into it as we go. So those are the things I'm currently reading. What do I have coming up? I mentioned last week that I had a library hold that became available, The Abstainer by Ian McGuire. I have not been able to start it. It's due back to the library on Saturday. I can't renew my hold because there are other people who have holds on it. So I decided I'm just going to return it, get back on the holds list, and I'll revisit it at some point. It's a shame, but it's just not going to happen right now. And I don't want to hold on to the book when there are other people waiting for it. So I'm, this is going to be moved to some unknown point in the future. I do still want to get to it at some point. I think I want to do a quick read of something this weekend. I'm going to look at this book, Bite Hard by Justin Chin. This is a collection of poetry. I mentioned it in my video about who are the best Asian American writers. This was one that really jumped out to me. And I ordered it thinking that I would read it in June when I prioritize LGBTQ reads. However, it just occurred to me that April is National Poetry Month. So this would be a great thing to fit in. And it's only about 122 pages. So I would love to fit it in. And that should be extremely doable. If you follow along, you know I don't really want to read more than one book at a time this year. So I don't think this is really going to take anything away from the yield. It's kind of a delicate way of fitting something in for April while also fitting something in for the month of April. So I can do Aussie April and National Poetry Month and not really overdo it. I am planning to get back to Infinite Country I think I'm going to wait until I'm further along in the yield before I even think about picking this back up. I was halfway through the audio of it. So this is another case where I don't have a lot left to do, but I actually want to restart it because I loved the language so much. I'm making it a little more complicated, but that's why I'm going to hold on this one. I still want to get to it in April, but it's probably going to wait. Maybe next weekend, maybe the weekend after that, when I can devote a little time to sit with it and try to get through. So again, I'm not taking away from the yield. That covers what I finished, what I have going on, and what's coming up. And a little bit of other news from the last two weeks and from this past week. I'd love to hear how your reading week has been, what you've been up to, what you've loved, what you've hated. If you have thoughts about any of this, please let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time. I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.